Hi, welcome to episode three of The Bachelor, Clayton's Journey to Find Love. We've got villains and vulnerabilities and a new format. Join me for another session of Rose Therapy. The doctor is in. Now, Jesse Palmer said at the start of the show that there are no rules on The Bachelor, so I'm mixing it up. Like my outfit too? Look familiar? Instead of a recap, I want to go over three cover stories. The first theme I'll call the villain theme. It's about Cassidy and Shanae. First, Clayton gets rid of Cassidy. He takes back the precious rose. The issue is that Clayton finds out from Sierra that Cassidy was boasting about a guy back home. Now, other people have had a field day with this way. I've heard everything from slut shaming, but I think it's more of a hypocrisy. After all, it's okay for Clayton to be dating 22 women, but the women can't have options. Now, there's more to the story than this, because in all fairness to Clayton, it's the lead's biggest fear that they fall for the wrong person the person that they take to the end has another relationship back home. And it has happened before. But if we analyze exactly what happened between Cassidy and Clayton, there are some clues about what went wrong. Now, first, Clayton approaches Cassidy and he's mad. Cassidy senses this immediately and she says, I already know what you're gonna say. It doesn't, here's what. You go first. I already know what you're going to say, though. Strong reaction. Now, she didn't, though, because now she's shocked. Clayton asks Cassidy directly, does she have another relationship? And she says no. But did she forget? Or is that the truth? Because she's in a situationship. She herself doesn't think of it as a relationship. But I want to analyze the conversation. Because here's the thing. Cassidy never reassures Clayton that she doesn't have feelings for the other guy. Think about it, right? She says that he doesn't want a relationship with me, but she doesn't say, I don't want a relationship with him. And here we see Cassidy going into victim mode. So imagine your claim and you're going to be on guard. But you would think of it, if he changes his mind, then is she all in, right? So what can we learn from this situation? Because that's why I'm here. I want to go a little bit deeper in this show today. What can we learn from this analysis? Now, the problem is Cassidy never checked in with Clayton, did she? Because it became about her, not about her partner. And Cassidy is forgetting how hard it is to be Clayton. Now, all the girls, right, are sitting thinking that the lead has all the power. But they forget the enormous pressure the lead is under, too. I want to show you how Cassidy might have handled things differently. Take, for example, that Cassidy approaches Clayton in a different way and says, Wow, Clayton, you look upset. I'm worried. Is everything okay? All right, then he asks her the question, are you having another relationship? And she might have said, oh, I'm so sorry you heard that. Of course you would be disappointed in me. What I did say, and right from the beginning, what I did say to the other girls was yes, that there was this guy from my past. But since meeting you and seeing how you treat women, I realize how little I've been putting up with. He's in my past, and I want to reassure you with everything that I have, Clayton, that I would never go back to this man because I'm here for you. Can you hear the difference in that? If Cassidy had reassured Clayton that she was not interested in this guy, I think we would have seen a very different story. But instead, Cassidy was defensive, she lied and said it wasn't a relationship until he pushed further. Then she became the tearful one 
needing reassurance from him. And by that point, it was just a little bit too much too late. Let me know what you think in the comments of my analysis of that story. All right, now let's go on to the second victim, villain story, and that's Shanae. Oh my goodness. Where to start here? Now, on session two, I thought that Shanae was really insecure, and I was being generous there, thinking that, yeah, she has an anxious attachment style, and what is it? She's wanting too much and expecting too much from Elizabeth. But I'm seeing a different flavor this week, and I'm going to call it something, and I'm going to qualify this. It looks to me like some narcissistic behavior. I want to be so careful about the use of these terms, and it's called media psychology because we're just observing. I don't know. I don't know Shanae personally. I haven't done an analysis. But from what I'm seeing, and I'm also saying narcissistic behavior can be on a very large spectrum and range, but I'm seeing a lack of empathy and a sense of entitlement. And those are concerns for me. Now, last week, Shanae made fun of Elizabeth's ADHD, obviously very insensitive. She minimized the issue, claiming that everyone has ADHD, that she was using her mental health as an excuse. But now we see it go even further. Shanae turns around and tells Clayton that her own mental health is suffering because Elizabeth and the other girls are bullying her. And I just, I'm feeling bullied in the house. Say that she's around certain people, don't talk to me. Say that she's not around, then people are like, Shanae, Shanae, Shanae. All right, so I have to stop and address the term bullying because it's a serious allegation. Bullying, by definition, is the use of force, coercion, hurtful teasing, or threat. It's to abuse, aggressively dominate, or intimidate someone else. The behavior is often repeated and habitual. One essential prerequisite for bullying is the perception by the bully or by others of an imbalance of physical or social power. And bullying is a subcategory of aggressive behavior categorized by hostile intent, imbalance of power, and repetition. Okay. So with those three qualifying things, is that what we're seeing? I don't see it. Unless they edit it all out, I just don't see it. Of course, the impact is to one's physicality, mental health, or emotionality. So... Again, back to the definition, I don't see bullying happening here. Now, I do think that Elizabeth has some social power more so than Shanae. Why? Because she's a nice girl. I think she's attractive. And I think Shanae is wildly jealous that more people like Elizabeth than her. But if we stick to the facts and what we've seen, what did we see from Elizabeth? After her interaction with Shanae, she tried to repair things. Remember, Shanae said, oh, you said I love you, and she didn't. She made shrimp and offered it to the other girls. I'll call that shrimp gate because there were only 15 shrimp to begin with, and Shanae eats half of them, though. So my question is, what could be fueling Shanae's strong reaction to Elizabeth? And for me, that looks like narcissistic rage. The person is upset when they feel rejected. And that's where the jealousy comes out. Now, Shanae also lacks insight because she's failing to see, or at least from our perspective, right, any of responsibility on her part. She conveniently forgets that she was the one who pushed Elizabeth first that she attacked Elizabeth's mental health and inappropriately disclosed Elizabeth's ADHD diagnosis to the group when it wasn't hers to own. But she'll say, well, I was bad and it's just a competition. Somehow that justifies her behavior. So what can we learn from all of this? Something to observe, and I want you to remember this from psychology, that when someone has a strong overreaction, and I'm calling Shanae an overreaction, 
to Elizabeth, there's usually a root cause. I think that for whatever reason, she's getting triggered by Elizabeth. And that happens when someone in your current life usually reminds you of someone from your history. Think about it. Let's say you have a withholding father who never sees you or gets you. You have a sister who's the favorite. And now someone comes into your life and it's just enough to trigger you. And for no justification or cause, you hate that person because they embody someone from your history. This is what I see happening between Shanae. She sees Elizabeth as her competition. Now, quite honestly, to, I don't see a connection actually between Elizabeth and Clayton or between Shanae and Clayton either. So I think this is going to be a story that will just wind down. I'm not making any excuses. What we're observing is just mean behavior. But if you get triggered by someone else, get into therapy, work through it because there's something from your history that's telling you there's something left undone here and you need to learn some better coping skills. Now, I also just for for reasons of playing the other side, there's one thing I needed to add in my own analysis of all of this, is that sometimes the producers can give a villain a really bad edit too. Now, Shanae is walking into her own issues. I think there's a lot of red flags here. But what I have heard is that one piece where she said, ah, he believed me, that was edited. And so remember, the producers don't usually take a nice person and give them a villain edit, but the person who's already stirring up a lot of uh, stirring the pot, so to speak, they can add fuel to the fire. And maybe Shanae is smarter than the rest of us. And really what I've also heard is that she wants to get on Bachelor in Paradise. And this is usually where the villains go. I'd love to get your comments, but please note that nothing unnecessarily mean or hateful because I will delete those because I won't put up with bullying either. All right, so enough about the villains. Let's move on to the other V, vulnerability. This segment contains sensitive subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. Can we take stock of the setup of the group date though? It's the exact same room and even the chairs that they use for Katie's group session. But instead of Nick Vial, we have Caitlin Bristow. Now, nothing against the Bachelor Bachelorette alumni, but for such tricky topics, I would love to see the groups run by a trained professional, a psychologist, a mental health person who knows how to run a group. Because what happens is oftentimes things get opened up that they can't get shut down. And it's so helpful to create safety in a group and an untrained person wouldn't know how to do that. Now, of those vulnerability stories that stood out for me were Marlena. Just being a woman of color, having to be 10 times better just to be seen and just to be heard has been a lot for me. And then Hunter, who had a boyfriend where she changed her eye color for him and he still cheated on her. He would want me to go to the gym and um, get this body that was nearly impossible for me to try to achieve. These are sad stories. So what is the point of even going there? Well, in many ways, I am an advocate for vulnerability because how else do you get to learn someone's story? How can you take care of them if you don't know what's happened to them? And I did appreciate Clayton's also disclosing about his body image. Interesting enough, I'd heard, and at some point I thought maybe he was a large kid, but it sounds like he was pretty scrawny in high school and he got some flack for that. So good for Clayton to support the women in sharing a story and not feeling so alone. Now, this brings me to my third and final analysis of the show because I like to, again, go a little bit deeper. And it's my wishful thinking. But in a more ideal world, how might Clayton B 
be handling his journey differently. Now, first off, it's not that I don't like Clayton or think he's doing a horrible job, but I'm beginning to wonder about his ability to be discerning. I already know that the producers only show you what they want, but we have had examples of leads, uh, like our last bachelorette, Michelle, would, who would have taken matters into her own hands, and therefore I'm thinking about that. So if there really are no rules, then I can think of at least a few different ways that Clayton could have handled the Shanae and Elizabeth drama. Hear me out. One, he could have stopped Shanae during her one-on-one. -on -one. Instead of making out with her, he could have asked her for more details. He might have said something like, you know, last week you said Elizabeth was two-faced. Can you give me more examples? What do you mean by bullying? That's a serious word. I'm concerned about your mental health. He could have gone deeper, right? Two, he could have actually stopped the group date, right? Not at the rose ceremony, but could have come into the group and said, ladies, I don't want to take any of your precious time because I want to meet with each of you personally. But I do need to hear from the group what you are observing because I need you to be my ears and eyes. Here's the thing, because the only way to stop bullying is a quick and firm response that you're not gonna put up with it and it's not okay. But we didn't get there. We got the he said, she said, what happened, and that wasn't going to produce a good outcome. Now, on The Bachelorette in particular, what we have seen before and something different with the men versus the women is the power of the group, right? So somehow the men are calling out the other guys, but the women we see are holding back in a different way. And we also see the women, I'm just going to say the bachelorettes, I think are more discerning to be able to pick up on certain information. And I'm not saying that Clayton is getting that because I think he's buying into Shanae's tears and because she approaches him first, she, he does believe her. All right. So what can we learn about all of this and how it applies to your own dating life or your relationship? I'm a big advocate for vulnerability and honesty because without it, what else do you have? In your own relationships, ask good questions and don't assume that the person who cries more is the person who's right. I hope you enjoy this week's analysis Join me next week and leave me your comments. I'd love to know what you think.